I went to the doctor uh, in August for my yearly checkup. And I wasn't, I wasn't looking forward to it. I seldom enjoy going to the doctor, uh, but I really wasn't looking forward to this, uh, this checkup. Uh, I knew I was a little worried about the test results because uh, I've gained some weight. Uh, I haven't been exercising like I should. Um, my doctor's amazing. She's wonderful. Uh, but she also isn't shy about giving me a hard time about stuff. So I show up, I'd already done my labs and, you know, my cholesterol was a little bit higher uh, than it's been historically. She noticed I'm about 10 pounds heavier than I was last year at this time. So she asked like, hey, how are you eating? Are you uh, eating healthy? I'm like, Ooh, I'd like to in theory. Sometimes I do, but sometimes I don't. She's like, well, um, how active are you? Or are you still uh, getting your exercise? I was like, oh, this summer I've been pretty bad. Actually, this whole year I've been pretty bad. Go through all of the things. She finally um, said, okay, well, here's, here's what I really want to ask you to do. I want to ask you to try to eat a little bit healthier. Uh, and I want to ask that you um, get a little bit more exercise, even if it's just going on a daily walk. Uh, and she said, and I really want you to focus on getting the rest that you need. I was like, yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know if you've ever had one of those experiences, but here's the thing. I didn't need to pay a doctor to tell me that I needed to eat healthy or that I needed to exercise or that I needed to get the rest uh, that my body needs. But I also, I needed somebody to tell me that. And I tell you that story, I mentioned that because I feel like tonight is going to be like that doctor's visit. I'm not gonna say anything likely that you don't already know. The advice that I give is really simple, it's basic, it's even common sense. But I also know as human beings, it is easy to lose our way. It's easy to um, not do the really simple but sometimes hard things to care for ourselves so I just want to throw that out there um, as the reality of what we might experience together uh, tonight. So vocation, vocational formation, vocational identity, those are words that I use often uh, in my work. And I want to begin by framing what I mean by vocation, because it is used ubiquitously. It's used all over the place. It has different meanings. And my hunch is if I were to ask what comes to mind when you think of vocation, lots of things would appear in the chat, career, work, job, trade, vocational schools come to mind. When I use the word vocation, I'm leaning heavily on the Latin root of the word vocation. Now, vocation comes from the word vocare, um, which means voice or uh, which means calling. And vocare comes from the Latin word vox, which is voice. And so when I talk about vocation, I talk about the three voices of vocation. I talk of the, about the voice of our identity. That is how we're wired. Um, those particular longings and passions that we have that are unique to us, those unique gifts that we have to offer the world. Uh, theologically, in the Christian tradition and the Hebrew tradition, this is called the Imago Dei, the image of God, that um, part of us that God has wired within us um, to bring to the world. So you have the voice of our identity. The second voice I talk about is the voice of our context. This is the world that we inhabit. It's the particular corner uh, that we exist in. I want to be clear, when I talk about vocation, I'm not just talking about our jobs. Our jobs are a part of our context, but it's not limited to that. I'm also talking about our neighborhoods. I'm talking about our communities of faith. I'm talking about third spaces, coffee shops or, or pubs or community centers, um, which we don't get to visit as often anymore, but there still exist those third spaces in our lives. And of course, our life at home. So when I talk about our context, I'm talking about all the different areas that we inhabit. And then the third voice that I talk about is the voice of God, that transcendent other that's pulling us into God's intention for the world. God longs for the world to be a place of justice and goodness and flourishing. So those are the three voices uh, that I'm, uh, I'm constantly talking about when I talk about vocation and vocational formation. 
And a few important notes. Again, I want to clarify, I'm not just talking about our work. It includes our work, but, but is, is not limited to our work. Attending to our vocational identity um, is attending to the kind of person we want to be in the world around us, no matter where we find ourselves. So this is both includes our jobs, but it's also in spite of our jobs. Um, there's good news and bad news that comes with this. And let me, let me begin with the bad news. Uh, attending to our vocational formation is much easier said than it is done. Uh, listening to our identity, listening to our context, listening to God is not always easy. It's like going to the doctor's office and then telling you what you should, and you know you should, but it's not always easy to actually live out, to embody. Attending to the voice of our identity is really difficult work. Um, let, me, let me confess some things about myself and project them onto anyone who's listening. Uh, we carry a lot of baggage with us. Now, baggage that has shaped us. Perhaps we've been hurt deeply by someone or just hurt in small ways um, enough times that we withhold a part of ourselves from others. Um, perhaps it's something we have to do to keep ourselves safe. We hold a lot of baggage, a lot of trauma that shapes who we are and how we understand ourselves. We also have uh, a lot of pathologies uh, that we're constantly having to negotiate. They shape us in conscious and unconscious ways. Uh, perhaps, like me, uh, you have a need to be liked. And so when you're in a setting, whether it's people you're just meeting or perhaps friends or family for a long time, you want to be liked. And so you try to adjust so that people will like you. Um, perhaps you have a need to feel productive or you have a need to be needed by other people. And so sometimes our identity can become muted because we're constantly negotiating and navigating these different versions of ourselves that we're wanting to project on others. Or perhaps there's a fear, a fear of being alone or a fear of uh, abandonment. Um, we, we're complex people and I've, uh, I, I still, I'm young, I'm only 43. Uh, my kids are 21, 19, and 17. I had kids at a really early age. Uh, we're learning how to parent adult children and anyone who has adult children, no one told me how miserable it is. My kids are great. I love them to death. But parenting adult kids is really a hard work. I thought it'd be easy. I thought once they graduated and went off to college, it's, it ends there, but it doesn't. Uh, but watching my kids grow and, and paying attention to my own growth, to be human is to be really complex. There is lots of layers, uh, many of which that we aren't aware of. And so listening to the voice of our identity is just difficult work, and it requires time, and it requires intentionality. A number of years ago, uh, we, we, our family had gone through a really awful season. My, my wife's brother um, died of brain cancer. Uh, I, the same day he died, I went into the hospital, spent 22 days, almost died myself surgery saved. Um, we, we, had a, we had a really hard season at church where five people died in the span of 12 weeks. It was, it was just one blow after another. Um, I was working as a minister, as a pastor uh, at a church in the Pacific Northwest, and I found myself, this is about six months or so afterwards, I found myself really tired and burned out, and I found my anger increasing uh, at church. I don't know if you've ever come across an angry preacher before. Um, I did a good job of bottling it up, but I was really frustrated with how things were going. And over time, as my wife encouraged me to, to find a therapist, um, I was able to identify that my anger that was growing had nothing to do with the church. Um, it had nothing to do with feeling burned out. It really had nothing to do with um, all of the things I wanted to point at. Um, it really went back to that season uh, when my brother-in-law was sick. Uh, my wife was going down and spending every weekend. And I realized that my anger was connected just feeling alone and feeling abandoned, right? I'm not blaming my wife in any way, shape, or form. She was where she needed to be. Uh, but it still left me alone with three kids. And it was hard. And I, I, I had to do a lot of work to attend to that. 
That story simply, I just want to communicate that attending to the voice of our identity, who we are, is not easy work. And the same is true when it comes to listening to the voice of our context or attending to the voice of our context. We are incredibly distracted. Uh, there is something vying for our attention um, at all times, constantly. Uh, there is, there's been a growing field um, around distraction theory. And they did a study um, where they mapped brain waves and when you receive a text or a phone call, it takes about 12 minutes, 12 to 15 minutes for your brain to get back to the patterns that you previously had before that distraction, before that interruption. Uh, and what's interesting is the average person receives a text or a phone call or an email uh, every 10 minutes. So they're being disrupted at a rate that's faster than our ability to recover from the distraction. So we are constantly distracted. We never catch up, right? I, I don't think it's an overstatement. We're distracted, generally speaking, across the board. It's also hard to, to listen to the voice of our context because we're incredibly busy. The list of to-dos never ends. We always have the next thing um, going. And my hunch is uh, you're in this webinar, you're anticipating either starting school or you've been in school, that you know what busyness is. Um, you likely have families, perhaps. You likely have job or jobs that you're working in. Now you're also attending school. You will never uh, have nothing on your to-do list. There will always be something you could be doing. It's also really hard uh, to pay attention to the voice for context because we're constantly moving at a really, really fast pace. Um, not only do we have a lot to do, we move at an incredible speed. Uh, and slowing down enough to see the thing that's right in front of us is not easy. To be present in a fast paced world, to pay attention to what's happening in our context is difficult when we're running at such unsustainable speeds. Uh, it's, it's interesting as um, working in, in churches um, for 18 years before I came to ACU, I, I did a lot of funerals. I spent a lot of time with people who were terminally ill and dying. And uh, this likely isn't going to come as a surprise to anyone. But when people are in their last days, uh, do you know what they want? They don't want more to do. Uh, they don't, they don't want to be busy again. What do they want? They want um, a few more minutes with the loved one. Uh, they want time with family. They want time with friends. Uh, in those last minutes when they have a little bit of clarity, what they really, really wish they have, um, it's not speeding up. It's actually slowing down and being present with the context, the, the people that they love right in front of them. So attending to the voice for context, pretty difficult. Um, also, attending to that which God might be up to in the world isn't an easy feat. Uh, I am, I'm one who has, is not fortunate to be the kind that's received a really clear word from God. Um, God has always moved in my life in a very faint whisper um, that oftentimes I get wrong. Uh, oftentimes I look back and what I thought was God's leading was really just my own pathologies, my own desires, um, cloaked as um, uh, me trying to convince myself this is what God wanted. Now the good news, God is faithful to use even um, things that we get wrong. Uh, so don't mishear me. But attending to what God is asking us and inviting us to do isn't always um, um, quick to discern or to point out. So this is the bad news, uh, that attending to the voice of our identity, context, and that which God might be up to isn't always easy. In fact, it takes intentionality and it takes um, uh, work. But here's the good news. Um, everything we need to embrace our vocational identity, everything we need uh, to live more fully into how we're wired, um, everything we need to engage our context with greater presence, everything we need to attend to that which God might be calling uh, us to is at our fingertips. We don't have to go looking for it. We don't have to create something new. Uh, we don't have to do, do something more or different. Rather, it's about learning to be present 
to what is already right in front of us. And so I wanna end by giving us a few suggestions like my doctor did in August that are really obvious, but they contribute to our own spiritual, mental, physical well-being, uh, which is gonna be really important as you either start or continue your educational journey um, to take care of yourself well. Um, but also these things open us up to a greater presence and embrace and welcoming of um, a flourishing humanity of that which God invites us to participate into. I'm not saying you have to do all of these things. I'm gonna sort of shotgun it and give you a bunch and take or leave whatever you need to. There's This also isn't an exhaustive list. Uh, my hope is here in a minute to give you a chance to maybe put in the chat bar uh, small things, acts of presence uh, that help you um, attend to these three voices. So here are a few things I want to invite you into. Uh, at least once a day, or once every two days, or if you can muster it up, once a week, a step away from a screen. Put down your phone, close your laptop, um, turn off the TV, and simply be present. Maybe it's being present uh, with a backyard or being present in a park, or maybe it's sitting, having a cup of coffee. Um, find a moment every day where you unplug from the technology that feels like it now has wires into us because it's always available. It is constantly at our fingertips. Uh, step away from a screen. Another in, uh, invitation I wanna invite you into is make a connection with someone you usually overlook. Uh, have you ever have you ever walked through a day and maybe you went to a grocery store and a coffee shop, you went to work, you went somewhere else, but when you look back, you realize, I don't remember a single face or a name of anyone I encountered, right? You're thinking about that to-do list, you're going to the next thing. Um, I want to invite you to pay attention to someone you usually overlook and just be present with them, even if it's, even if it's for a moment. Uh, learn somebody's name. Call the grocery clerk by name and ask them how they're doing and actually mean it. Uh, pay attention to the server at a restaurant. Maybe it's learning to pay attention to someone who's standing on a street corner with the cardboard sign. Um, perhaps it's the person who cleans the building you work in or the building you live in. Learn their name and say hello and call them by name. Um, pay attention to a neighbor you seldom see right? Really, really small things. But I'm telling you, learning to be patient, learning to be present in the context right in front of us um, creates a connection, not only within ourselves, but with others. And I believe um, with God and how God wants us to live in the world. Another really simple practice of presence is identify things you're grateful for. When you wake up in the morning, um, think, what are three things I'm grateful for today? And it doesn't have to be big. A good cup of coffee is a gift from God, I'm convinced. Um, maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's a, a loved one, a memory of a loved one that you haven't seen in a long time. But learning a practice of gratitude helps us to be present because it helps us identify that which we care for. Uh, another thing, when you're talking with somebody, maybe this is the grocery clerk, maybe it's um, someone at work, or maybe it's a loved one, maybe it's a classmate, resist the temptation to go to the next thing on your to-do list and stay a little bit longer than you would otherwise. I had a mentor uh, who, whenever he would go visit somebody in the hospital who was sick, he cleared out his entire schedule uh, the rest of the day. And he did this just in case that person who was sick needed him to be there. Now, we don't always have the freedom or the luxury or the privilege to create that kind of space, but we do have the opportunity to stick with somebody for five or 10 or 15 minutes longer, even though that to-do list is vying for our attention. Uh, so resist that temptation when you can. Uh, listen to my doctor, Dr. King, and go on a walk. Uh, without earbuds in, uh, just go on a walk and pay attention. Um, pay attention to the wind and the neighborhood and the trees and the houses and the people you see. Just go on a walk and look around. 
Uh, another practice I want to invite you into is a practice of examen. Uh, this is an um, ancient practice within the Christian tradition. It uh, comes from the Ignatius um, tradition, and it is simply at the end of the day, looking back and asking what was life giving and what was life limiting or life taking, right? So where did you experience life, goodness, joy, hope, uh, excitement, connection? Where did you experience um, something that took from you, you know, frustration or anger, or anxiety? And it grows from the notion that God is often found in the small things of our lives. And if we're paying attention to our lives, we'll better identify ways to more fully embrace um, that which God is inviting us into, but also ways that we're perhaps limiting um, the work and activity of God in our midst. So the practice of examen is really easy. Three more, and then uh, I promise uh, I'll give you a chance to write in the chat. Um, five minutes of silence. Practice five minutes of silence a day. I'm convinced it'll change your life. Uh, engage a new practice of prayer. Um, there, we're different people. We connect with prayer in different ways. Um, explore um, ways to, to pray. I'm happy to give you resources if you want them. Uh, and finally, let me say this, be kind to yourself. Um, please, please, please extend yourself grace. I am convinced we are far more, we're far more anxious about what we're doing or not doing than God is. Uh, we live oftentimes with constant sense of guilt and shame. And I believe every day, uh, God looks at creation and is like, okay, um, let's give this a go. Um, let's try it again. Um, let's see how we can live more fully into what God wants us to do.